Hi guys, it's Paul McArdle here. This is the uh, the fourth video in the series about the standards check and the part three test. What we're going to be looking at in today's video is the teaching and learning strategies in particular. So as before, I'm going to share the screen in a moment so we can get a, a video presentation up uh, so that we can actually go through um, this particular uh, video session. So if you just wait for a moment, where are we? Where are we? Share screen. Here we go. There we go. And share. All right. I'll just try and see if I move myself out of the way a bit there. Excellent. So um, as I said, this video is to do with the series on the part three and the standards check test. And in particular, we're now going to be looking at it in more detail on teaching and learning strategies, and particularly the way the DVSA are looking to assess these particular strategies on, on this particular test, or on all these particular tests. So, let's first of all look at uh, the guidance from the examiners. And what we're going to do is I'm just about to repeat something that we've previ previously stated in the earlier videos. Uh, but it helps put everything into context, really, as far as teaching and learning strategies. What it shows you is that the DVSA are still keen for you to use some of the more teaching orientated strategies and not just necessarily the learning strategies, i.e., for example, coaching and uh, discovery learning. So as it says here, the important thing to remember when considering teaching and learning styles is that it is not just about coaching. It is about client-centered learning. Our judgment should be about whether the PDI, ADI can help the pupil to learn in an active way. Also remember instruction based around the old core competencies and also the instructional techniques used currently is still pretty good. We must not throw that away. We are trying to increase the options available to a PDI, ADI. Coaching is a powerful extension of the range of options. It is not an automatic replacement for any of the existing ones. So all the existing skills that you need to be a driver instructor must still be in place. The main change is the, the introduction of coaching and the greater emphasis on um, client uh, involvement. There may be many times, it goes on to say, there may be many times when it is useful to use a coaching technique. The principle that under, underpins coaching is that an engaged pupil is likely to achieve a higher level of understanding and that self-directed solutions will seem um, far more relevant and, and longer lasting, actually. This applies in every situation, including instruction. So... It then finally goes on to, to bring us back to the importance of not forgetting the basic skills that an instructor has. Is Direct instruction is still useful in helping a pupil in the early stages cope with new situations or supporting a pupil who is clearly struggling in a certain situation. Good coaching will use the correct technique at the correct time, matching the pupil's needs. In some cases, the PDI ADI may need to give direct instruction through a particular difficult situation. That instruction forms part of a coaching process if the PDI ADI then engages the pupil in an analysis uh, of the pupil to analyze the problem, sorry, and take responsibility for the learning from it. Therefore, a good PDI ADI will take every opportunity to reinforce learning. So we start with that just to remind everybody as we have on, on some of the previous videos of how important the existing core competencies are, uh, but in a much more client-centered way, uh, and the older instructional techniques um, as well. They still, they still exist, but they're basically spread across the, the new 17 competencies uh, to varying degrees. So here are the 17 competencies that we're now working on, the 17 competencies that we've been going through. We've looked at, um, we've looked first of all at an overview of the test itself 
and the 17 competencies. We've then spent some time looking at lesson um, planning competencies, i.e. L1 to L4. We then went on in the second um, second video, to, sorry, the, the third video to look at risk management competencies, R1 through to R5. And then in this session or in this video, we're gonna be looking at the teaching and learning strategies um, competencies T1 through to T8. So before we do that, let's just remind ourselves of what it is the DVSA are particularly interested in assessing. Now you'll know from the previous uh, videos that the, the bit that the DVSA are really interested in as far as a driving lesson is concerned, it's the middle bit. It's the middle bit where all the practical driving takes place, where all the practical learning uh, is involved, partly because, as, as you realise, that's where the most likely situation is for there to be risk involved. It's also why they've actually said they don't really want you to bring a beginner to either the part three or the standards check. They want somebody at least partly trained, I assume that's probably had anything from 15 to 20 hours of training already, or at least 10 hours of training, um, so that you are going to be doing some uh, meaningful training out on the roads where there will be some uh, traffic involved, et cetera. So that's really how they're, they're looking at it. Well, if we look at the middle bit, as we pointed out to you before, the way the LDC approach works and the student-centered approach we work is as a series of learning chunks, or sometimes they're called lesson chunks, or sometimes they're even called learning cycles. So. As we go along, the lesson is basically broken down in this to a series of um, lesson chunks. Um, each chunk will have some goal or purpose associated with it. It will have some activity. And then at some point there will be a review or a reflection of what's happened so far. And in light of that, then there may be some modification of the goal or, or, uh, or, uh, or, or the need that's going to be addressed or, or the purpose of the next unit then there'll be some activity um, and then a reflection and it carries on however as we've said in the previous videos this pattern um, needs to be can uh, potentially uh, changed if um, if a potentially a safety critical incident happens um, then that's that's the situation where you need to break out of the normal loop and use more of the old core competencies approach in client-centered uh, learning uh, and then adapt the lesson accordingly, which has been covered elsewhere. So I'm not going to go into any more detail. Uh, if you wonder if the core competencies really are see it, say it, suss it and, and sort it basically. But I, I do want to have a look at the actual, what a chunk is in a bit more detail, because I think that will be helpful to us before we look at each of the teaching and learning competencies in turn. So your part three or your standards check lesson is probably going to be made up of no more than four to five of these uh, learning chunks. And each learning chunk will start with some sort of agreed plan. Um, so you agree a plan of activity, uh, which is effective year, year L1 to year L3. Um, that will help the pupil to move towards the achievement of their learning goals or needs. Usually it'll involve some sort of circular route or a specific location, if it was, for example, a, a, a manoeuvre, uh, will be suitable for the driving activity or exercise. Naturally, all of this activity has to be matched to the student's ability at this stage. And what it makes a, a, a logical next learning step based on what they've developed, how far they've developed so far. So that goes, if you like, without stay, saying. So first of all, you agree uh, a plan of activity. The word is agree, which means you agree with the pupil as a minimum. Um, you agree any support that needs to be given as part of the activity. Uh, this is usually but not always to do with risk management sometimes it is to do with sim simply simplifying the task you know for logical reasons um uh, for logistical reasons sorry uh, you may need to somehow simplify the task um, and using um, support uh, can enable you to do that so that might be uh, a reason so it's part of this hour when you're actually talking about 
who's going to be doing what. Uh, route directions usually come in here as well because you need to know, am I driving, is the student driving independently? Um, in other words, do they know what the loop is that we're about to complete, the route that we're about to undertake? And if they do and they're confident that they can go around that route by themselves, then that might be a choice that's been made between you and the student. Alternatively, the student may still want you to give them route directions um, as part of the activity. So that's got to be clear whether, you know, who's going to take responsibility for that? How's that going to, to work exactly on this next uh, uh, attempt at this activity, this learning chunk? Um, you should always be ready to intervene to keep everyone safe. So that is a program that is always there. That's always in the background. We, if you, as you know, with our free hat approach, uh, we refer to that as the guard in the safety role. So that that hat is always on. You're always ready to uh, to come in if necessary. And again, depending on the circumstances, you may need to reassure the student at this stage that, remember, I've got your back. Uh, if I need to intervene, I will do, but we'll discuss it later you know, et cetera. You don't need to repeat everything that you would have repeated, no doubt, in the very first lesson when you met them, but you may need to, to give them some reassurance in that regard. So that's that point you agree, um, the support you, you're going to give um, and, you know, the level of instruction that you're likely to give, et cetera. Um, and if there are any known difficulties on this particular route, then there may be specific um, risk management strategies that are agreed just for that particular part of the route. But whatever it is, it's got to be clear what's happening, what's the purpose, you know, what am I trying to achieve, what am I trying to do? Not only you as the instructor, but the pupil needs to fully appreciate, uh, pr appreciate this as, as well. But not only do you and the pupil need to appreciate it, also, because it's a part for your standards check, the examiner needs to appreciate it. So one of the reasons for discussing this very clearly with your pupil and clarifying so that everybody knows what they're doing and that so the pupil's got the buy-in is so that the examiner is aware of what you're trying to do in this next chunk of activity. What is the purpose? What we're trying to achieve? What goal is, are we aiming for? Or what um, learning need are we addressing at this point? What is it that we're trying to um, to improve upon, basically? Um, and so every driving activity has to have a clear learning purpose. And each party involved, I primarily you and the pupil, should know what, what they are doing. And in the case of the examiner, he should know what's going on. Um, because if he's not sure, then he'll make the assumption the pupil's not sure, which isn't, won't bode well for you. So everybody needs to know need to be on the same page basically what are we doing in this next five or ten minutes because that's typically all um an activity would last for is five or ten minutes um before some review or some feedback would uh, naturally need to be given um, the main need you may need to give feedback uh, because there may be opportunities that you see as you're doing the activity in the moment uh, which uh, makes sense for you to bring out at the time that they happen, because it's such a good opportunity not to be missed that you actually might bring that into your lesson, even though that wasn't necessarily the stated objective um, of this particular piece of planned activity. And nevertheless, something has arisen, which which is, is basically too good an opportunity to miss. So then you go on to execute the plan of activity. And, and if you're wondering where the, this would where you might be marked if you don't do a great job in this 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 regard is of course one of the things as part of the planned activity if you're giving the route directions then those route directions have to be uh, given in a clear manner if you're actually going to provide some level of instructional support either because you're simplifying the task or it's part of a, a risk management strategy that you've agreed then any of the, those instructions have to be clear and have to be completely expected and not out of the blue as far as the, the student's concerned. But of course, you would have made clear what you proposed to do and you would have got their agreement before you started. So that's hopefully as a consequence of that, R1 and R2, sorry, R2 and R3 will take care of itself. R3, 
is more to do with being aware of the surroundings. So obviously, as soon as the car starts moving, this is where you need to be aware of your surrounding, what's happening around you, what's going on, where are the dangers coming from, uh, and how are, what is your pupil doing, and how are they responding, and how are they reacting to the environment and what's going on around them. So that straight away comes in, in into play. Um, although it's a risk management thing, it is also, if you think about it, it is is a teaching thing because you need to be aware of what your student's doing, how they're getting on, how they're feeling. Um, uh, otherwise, you can't help them from a, a teaching or a learning perspective. So R3 is equally important for, for teaching. But that really, if it, if it was just teaching related, then it would actually go into T1 was the teaching style suitable? So now the way you're actually conducting this activity, does it suit the student? Is it working with them? Is it at the right level? Is the help or the way you're involved with the student suitable for, for them at this stage? Um, it would also then move on to, do you encourage students to analyze their own problems and take responsibility? So as things happen, how do you deal with it? Do you direct them all the time or do you try to get them involved and actually get them to figure out things for themselves? Hence where T2 comes in. Uh, T3 is to make sure that they know what the learning outcome is that they're trying to achieve or what they have achieved. And, and often that is, uh, is, is, is best done by actually explaining what the opportunity is um, that has arisen or um, it could be to use an example to show uh, what that might be. So that's why you might have T3 coming at, at this stage. Um, you may be giving some technical information as you're actually going about this learning exercise. So that's where T4 might come in. And you might need to give some useful feedback um, as part of the activity as well, which is why the T, T5 might occur at this stage. Um, this may result in some queries from the pupil as you're doing the activity. So again, how you answer those uh, queries would be T6. And then T7, um, did you uh, maintain appropriate uh, non-discriminative professional manner throughout this session? That may come in. If there are some um, particularly poor examples of driving going on, then how you deal with that, how, how you allow that to materialize and how you refer to that could it could potentially bring in t7 uh, um, as well and also the way in which you deal with with your pupil you know if you're um taking over their space if you you know if you're getting too touchy, touchy feely then straight away you're into t7 as well because that's not really a professional way to go about uh, delivering driving lessons so that's why we've got all those different um, potential um, competencies potentially coming in and being assessed by the examiner as you execute the plan. As we said, that will probably be about no more than five to ten minutes. Then at some point you will review the activity. Now there are a number of reasons why you might wish to review the activity uh, uh, and you particularly want to review the activity if you intend to adapt the plan. Um, so why might you wish to uh, adapt the plan? Well, first of all, you might wish to adapt the plan because the safety critical driving fault has been prevented by you, which is great because that means that you're on your guard and you've done a good R4. Um, if that's occurred, then you're going to have to do a good R5 because you're going to have to give some good feedback um, to do with that. You need to see, say, it, suss it and sort it, as we say. The sort it comes out more as you go back round and, um, and decide what your next plan of activity will be, having looked at this. Um, T1, T2, again, comes, uh, comes potentially comes in to analysing this fault um, and deciding what happened. Uh, because it's safety critical, it's usually about getting to the root cause of, of the driving fault and from that developing some sort of uh, suitable remedial action. But as you're doing that, you may be giving technical information, you may be giving feedback, you may be answering queries, um, you may 
not be dealing with it in an appropriate and a professional manner, which is why T7. So that's why they're they're potentially there as as competencies that might arise if as part of your review, the review is to do with the safety critical driving fault having been prevented or occurred. If the pupil was clearly having difficulty dealing with the activity that you've set, then again, the, uh, the plan's basically not working. So you need to stop, you need to review, you need to think about what's going on. You need to reassess your teaching style. You need to reassess how much you are or you aren't involving um, the pupil. I try to involve the pupil too much and just confusing the life out of them. Um, you know, clarifying learning objectives, perhaps quite, uh, perhaps the pupil doesn't know what those objectives really are. Um, sorry, the, those outcomes are. So you could have a, a, a T4, you, 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 sorry, a T3. You could have T4 because, again, as part of confusing or difficulties that you've not explained or the technical information you've given is confusing, is not correct. Um, maybe the feedback you're giving is not that great. Um, so you need to think about all these things could potentially be marked at this point. Um, obviously, the, the, the great thing is that you've recognised it. So the fact that you've recognised it and you're now about to do something about it um, is the important thing, rather than uh, worrying uh, that, that, that it's happened and it, it could potentially affect some of these some of these scores. Yes, you're considering some of these things in terms of saying what is it I'm doing, and I'm and, and am I am I meeting those particular competencies? Is and if if it's I'm not meeting those competencies, and that's why the students having difficulty. Then obviously you need to rethink about how you're meeting those particular competencies. If the pupils seem confused, distracted, or bored with the activity, then the same thing happens again. There's something about your teaching, uh, um, um, your teaching um, strategies or your teaching or your learning strategies that are perhaps are not right, um, especially if they're bored or distracted. The chances are either they're not bought into this. It's not. It's not at the right level. You know, they're finding it too straightforward. They're not really learning anything from it. So. Um, that could be the reason. But again, if the fact you detected this is the good thing, that's the important thing, you've done that, you're now assessing, well, where do I need to change? What do I need to change to potentially resolve this issue? Um, the reason why you're having a review or an adaptive lesson could be because you've achieved your objective or your, your goal either in power or in full. Um, so now you need to look at actually what do you do next because there's no point in just doing what you can already do uh, again and again and again that doesn't really move the student forward so um as soon as something's been achieved in part or in full you need to think well what else can i add because if you've partly achieved it then maybe you can now add something else to the plan um, as a consequence of that, or if you've achieved it in full, you might need to think about moving on to a completely different goal altogether, or you might need to really step up what it is uh, that, that you're doing. So that's another reason why you might review um, the plan. Um, and the final reason is you may have simply agreed a review point and that review point's been reached. So you might have agreed that you would review what happened after one loop or after two loops, or after such and such. But even though you may have an agreed review point after three goes or two goes or whatever it happens to be, if any of the above becomes apparent to you, then don't carry on if it's not working. Don't say, well, we said we wouldn't actually have a review and, until we've gone around it 10 times. You know, If it's not working or if any of the other things happen above, then review it then don't don't stick to the original agreed uh, review plan which was in after 10 attempts um you know uh, do what makes sense to you and it, if you think about it it's all logical it's all obvious if something's not working the, the quick thing is to change and do something about it which then takes us on to the next stage 
typically in a learning jump, which is to adapt the lesson uh, plan in some way, the L4 as necessary. And the way in which you might be adapting the plan um, is that you could be increasing or reducing the challenge. If the challenge was too great as, as because, and that was proven because the student was having difficulty, then maybe what you need to do is reduce the challenge or you need to consider why is it that they're finding it difficult? Because it might not be uh, one of your, uh, your your teaching competencies, although it's probably more to do with, you know, not reading your student very well uh, today because maybe they're not feeling well or they have something else that's uh, uh, causing them issues, which is why they're struggling uh, dealing with something that you would have thought they wouldn't have had much trouble dealing with um, or um, you didn't expect it to be such a barrier to them. So um, you might need to reduce the challenge if that was the case. But more often than not, if they have achieved something, then you're looking to step it up. What can we add? What can we, uh, what can we do? And, and these are the options you need to be thinking about at, at this stage. So um, that's effectively part of your review, part of your, what we're going to adapt. You might decide that it's appropriate to increase or decrease the instructional support that you've provided, um, either because of risk management issues um, or because um, it makes sense from a teaching point of view. Maybe the way you're going to, if you like, increase the challenge is by reducing the instructional support you provide on the next couple of attempts. You know, always being prepared to step back in if, if needs be. But obviously, if, if you are providing support, then it, it's important for you to try to get to a point where you don't provide that support. Um, and they do things on their own. Um, it's called transfer responsibility. So if you're using, if you have to use support, if they need your support to achieve something, then uh, as quickly as possible, you need to get them to a point where they no longer need that support, but can still achieve it on their own. So if, if it's support that you're changing, that's, that's what you would change. It could simply be that... Um, you pick the completely the wrong goal to aim for, and it's not really what they're interested in, or it's not appropriate, or there may be some physical reason why when you've actually gone round the route, you can see that you can't actually do that lesson today. So you might make a big change in the lesson or change in the goal, the need, the activity, or even the practice area as appropriate. But whatever it is, um, you then make those choices. You look at what you're doing, and that inevitably causes you to uh, have a new agreed plan of activity and a new um, agreed plan of support. So naturally, having considered those things, you're then going to go around and the next chunk of learning is going to be different from the previous chunk of learning. So every chunk of learning or every time you stop a review, the next bit should be different in, in some way. In other words, you've adapted the lesson plan in some way hopefully because it's to keep developing the student further one step on um that's that's the ideal but if that's not the case it doesn't matter at the end of the day the student the examiner it is as it said in in the, um, the advice and the guidance it's not that you necessarily achieve a learning outcome it's the fact that the process that you're applying is right to achieve a, a learning outcome. So the life outcome doesn't have to happen, but you've got to be seen that you're making the right choices about what you're doing um, in, in that regard, whether you're stepping it up, stepping it back. So at the end of the day, because the student might be having a really off day, you might be end up backtracking and you may in fact be uh, not at the same position that you were at the, at the end of the previous lesson. But that isn't necessarily a bad lesson. If you've managed it, you've kept it under control um, and the student has gained additional experience um, and everybody's been kept safe and not deflated, then, um, then that can still result in, in a pass uh, for a part three or indeed a, a standard check. So I thought it was probably just worth spending a little bit of time before we looked at each of the uh, individual competencies for teaching and learning strategies 
um, just so that you're clear about or a little bit clear about what these learning chunks are. They aren't quite as prescriptive as I've made them out here. It's a bit more fluid than it's actually seen here. It's seen as nice six little points. It's a bit more fluid than that in reality. But that should give you an idea of, of what you're trying to do. And if you do that well, then the pupil knows what they're doing, you know what they're doing, and the examiner can see what you're doing. And as long as they're appropriate and you don't fall foul of these individual competencies, particularly the ones we're going to be talking about, teaching and learning strategies in a minute, then you should pass. You shouldn't have any difficulty. So let's look at the first competency, T1. Was the teaching style suited? to the pupil's learning style and current ability. If we look at the DVSA and guidance to examiners, what I've done, as, as before on the previous videos, I've extracted those bits from the examiner's guidance that I think are particularly pertinent to explaining exactly what any of these competencies are. And one of the things in this, this guidance is an indication of having competence in this regard would include, so this is a direct quote, from uh, the guidance as, as I've done on, on the previous uh, uh, video. So having competence in this regard would be actively working to understand how they can best support the pupil's learning process. They might not achieve a full understanding in the session. It is the attempt that demonstrates competence. So this is straight, again, this is another confirmation of this, this fact, um, that it's, it's not so much uh, the student having to improve um, it, um, although obviously that's that's the ideal scenario, it's the fact that the process is right, the way you're going about it and the way you're doing it is correct. That's what the examiner is particularly uh, interested in marking. Modifying teaching style when or if they realise that they need to do so. So um, the examiners realise that matching your st teaching style to their learning style, to their current uh, emotional state or physical state isn't a you know isn't a precise science but what they're really interested in is can you see when something's not working and then can they see you doing something to try to address that that's what they're interested in is will you carry on regardless and get nowhere or demoralize the student or will you do something about it so modifying your teaching style when or if they realize there is a need to do so is a, a sign of having competence. Um, as part of this, providing accurate and technical correct demonstrations, instructions or information, given the technically incorrect information, uh, instructions or information is an automatic fail if that input might lead to a safety critical point. So you'll see that this comes out uh, several times and it's already been mentioned uh, previously in other videos. Um, this is why it's so important that you do look at the binder one work and you do take the trouble to get all that background knowledge and understanding, whether it be to do with driving techniques, whether it be to do with the highway code, whether it's to do with traffic law, whatever it happens to be that ties in with all those different LDC lessons. It's imperative that you know that like the back of your hand and you're not scrambling about on this lesson, on this part for you, trying to think, well, what's it say again about that in the highway code? I know it says something, I just can't think of it. It's no good. It's got to be instantly there. You've got to be able to do everything. You, you've almost got to be able to drive uh, by driving by words, if you like. So it's not good enough just to know how to drive, but you have to know and be able to communicate step by step what you do, not only what you do, but why you do it as well, which is why commentary driving is also very important uh, at part two. It's not particularly, although it does in fact enhance your driving ability as it, as it happens because you're becoming more conscious of it. But the commentary driving is really more to do with getting you ready uh, for part three, because when you're on the move in the real world, you don't have time to think a lot. So things have to be instantly available to you and they're only going to get bit to be like that if you take the trouble to learn the knowledge um, and the understanding of why best practice is best practice.
using practical examples and other similar tools to provide different ways of looking at a particular subject um, would also indicate that you have competence in, in this regard. And linking learning in theory to learning in practice, being able to make that little, that nice bridge between something they've learned in theory, possibly through the LD workbook, for example, or the highway code, and then how that works in practice, um, again, would show signs that you, you know what you're doing, basically, in this regard. Um, it actually continues because there's quite a few other things it mentions. Other things it mentions as having competence in this regard include encouraging and helping the pupil to take ownership of the learning process. Again, it's about client-centered uh, uh, learning. That means where you can is try to get the student to take as much ownership of the learning process themselves. In other words, thinking for themselves. The more they just do as they're told, the less likely they are to think for themselves. So the more you get them involved in the process, in all the decisions that you're making as well, uh, the better it will be, the more effective that will be. So if you're doing that, then again, that would be an example to the examiner that you've, you, you, you've got competence in this regard. Responding to faults in a timely manner, particularly safety critical uh, driving faults, um, you now know the the importance of that and the importance of the DVSA attached to that. Not surprisingly, it's because they are examiners and they're great at assessment. So the one thing that they're doing when they're taking people out for driving tests, whether it be part two tests or, part, or, or normal driving tests, is they recognize when a driving fault has been committed. So they expect, uh, understandably so, that you know that as well and you will bring that to the student's attention. Provide enough uninterrupted time to practice new skills. So this is really a call for those instructors who talk too much, who end up running away with themselves um, and not really giving the student the opportunity to have a little bit of quiet when they're practicing or trying something so they can get a feel for what it is that they're trying to do. Um, sometimes your input, even though the words of what, whatever you're saying might be brilliant stuff, if it's interfering with the student getting to grips with what they're doing, then it's it's not it's not helpful. Um, so that's that's what that's about. Um, providing the pupil with clear guidance about how they might practice outside the session. So this is talking about involving potentially the parents, the extra practice they can get. Again, the beauty of the LD system and the workbook and the, the approach that we've adopt adopted means that they that parents have got ideal guidance as well. They can use the same materials that the, the pupil can use to help help provide this extra practice um, in an effective way rather than a, in, a, in a, a contradictory way, which can sometimes happen when parents get involved, especially if they don't have the guidance and the, and, and the, uh, the driving instructor doesn't, doesn't get involved with the parents. Uh, it can result in, um, because things obviously have changed since they were learning to drive, and they may have misconceptions anywhere which they would potentially pass on to their their, their um, siblings, which um, uh, to their kids. So you do need to, uh, you know, you do need to provide clear guidance about how how to do that. And in fact, the DBSA published their own guidance in this respect to help ADIs, but LDC have been doing it for for many years. So if we carry on with what else is said in the guidance to examiners, there's another direct quote again. The PDI ADI should take into account all that they understand about the pupil. They should recognize that different pupils will have different preferred approaches to learning, although they may only emerge fully over a number of lessons. So they're, they're saying it's natural for you not necessarily to immediately be at one with the, with the student, with the learner. If a question and answer technique is used, this should match the pupil's level of ability and encourage them to use a higher level of thinking to give a response. Well, that's only going to be appropriate once the student is at a point where they've actually got the spare capacity to do that level of thinking while, uh, while you're involved in the driving. At an early stage, they probably don't have that spare capacity and they're more worried 
uh, about with controls on the vehicle. And so there is no real uh, capacity for them to start thinking about answering uh, sophisticated questions or getting uh, 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 you know, an in-depth understanding of something while they're driving because they're trying to concentrate on the driving at that stage. So that's what that's really saying is making sure that you match, you're matching your techniques to the student and the situation at the time. Asking close questions of a pupil is demonstrating a high level of ability um, would suggest um, to, to the examiner that you put touch, you're, you're over instructed because you're basically asking them yes, no questions um, when clearly the person um, is beyond that step. Although it does give you the caveat here that if it's just to check knowledge, then that that would be uh, that would be okay. Otherwise, they consider it to be of little use, as it says. Asking open questions to a pupil of limited ability, and this is another form of distraction, I guess, who is finding it difficult to achieve the test they have set for themselves may be very confusing, which is what we just said earlier. So that's exactly how it's written in the guidance, and, it's, and it shows you what information they provided to their examiners in terms of how they should assess your ability in regards to this competence. So what is lack of competence? Well, they say adopting a teaching style clearly at odds with the pupil's learning style. Um, failing to check the pupil, whether the approach they're taking is acceptable. So if you, uh, uh, you know, do something, whether it be a demonstration, whether it be an explanation, make sure it's actually welcomed. You know, if not, then clearly, uh, it'll become apparent to the instructor, the examiner, that it's not. Um, and the examiner will be thinking, why didn't he ask the pupil that before he started uh, going into all that detail? Failing to explore other ways of addressing a, a particular problem, a learning point, sorry. So if a learning, if a student is struggling with a learning point, especially if it's an important learning point for the practical exercise that they're about to do, um, then it's important that you figure out other ways of dealing with it um, if it's apparent to you that the student's not not making sense of what it is that you're saying. Um, so again, it's about making the effort to um, be flexible in the way in which you deal with your student to match what your student needs. Um, and that's, it. that's the thing that they're really testing, more so than whether uh, the student eventually gets the learning point or not. Concentrating on delivering teaching tools rather than looking uh, for learning outcomes. This is a very classic thing that, that students do. They, they they get new toys, they get new learning aids, they get loads of stuff from the internet. And then they inflict these teaching tools and these methods on their pupils, irrespective of whether it's helping to achieve the learning outcome um, that the student wants um, uh, at all. And it's easy to fall in into that trap because you think, well, this is a great way to explain something. So I'm going to explain something like this to everybody. And I've got my little cars and I've got my little visual aids. Um, no, you follow the student's interest. It's what coaching is about, where we say, you know, what you're doing is you're actually giving them what they need, not what you think they need. Ignoring safety issues would again show a lack of competence. So, now let's look at how we would suggest that you would mark yourself or in respect of this T1 if you were doing a lesson reflection using the, the lesson reflection that's in your, in your logbook. Well, first of all, you would ask yourself these questions. Did you build a good rapport with the learner and communicate effectively? Remembering that communication is about what's received, not necessarily what's sent. And did you demonstrate a good understanding of what the pupil hoped to achieve and where they are now? In other words, do you know where the student is and do you know what they wanted to achieve and do you know how they're going to get there? Does it make sense? Did you show that you actually were appreciative of that? Did you help the learner to recognise suitable learning activities in line with their learning style, preferences or ability or experience and emotional or physical state. So again, um, don't just say, this is what you're going to do. These are the learning activities I've set. Discuss what it is that you're proposing 
and at least make sure that you get agreement from the student that they are seem to be a, a sensible way forward for them and is something that they would like to do. Um, so uh, that's what you should be doing. Encourage the learner to consider a variety of different learning methods and approaches. And it also says both in the lesson and outside. So this is where, you know, bringing the workbook, bringing the, the video, um, bringing the hardware code, bringing any really useful reference materials that you think will have aid, uh, aid the student in uh, developing their understanding or their knowledge. Um, respond to faults, or if you like, opportunities for development, as we prefer to call them. Uh, and in fact, I think there's some, uh, one of the quotes I've given from the DVSA's uh, Guide to Examiners, where he says as much as well, rather than seeing them as driving faults, see them as opportunities for further development. By the learner in, in an appropriate way and prevent faults where possible for safety reasons. So you've always got to be prepared to intervene because the DVSA would always prefer you to stop a fault happening, especially if it's a safety critical fault, rather than allowing it to happen and then say, what can we learn from that? Um, sometimes you might not be able to stop the situation arising because it all happens too quickly and it, it genuinely is, is unexpected. Um, uh, obviously then you've got to minimize the consequences of, of, of that as best you can um, uh, and then deal with it in a retrospective way but if you can step in beforehand um, give a little bit of support ask a question give a prompt whatever it might be then then do so that would show that your teaching style is suited to the pupil's learning style help the learner to recognize what approaches work well for them so if something appears to work well for them, don't assume it will always work for, well for them. Ask them, how did that work for you? Um, and uh, would that be a, a good way to proceed with the next bit that we're trying to develop in a similar fashion? Um, encourage the learner to take ownership of the learning process. You're always trying to throw, if you like, the ownership ball back into their courts whenever you can to get them involved in driving their own learning wherever, uh, excuse the pun, uh, wherever, wherever possible. Um, you know, not obsessively so, if the student can't do it, then the student can't do it, and you're just gonna have to help them out and give them choices, uh, for example. Create a safety, uh, safe learning environment by providing a suitable level of instructional support. Don't be, uh, so coaching orientated that you think, oh, I, I'm not going to give any instructions. I'm not going to tell the person ever what to do. Um, you know, sometimes the smart thing is to actually tell somebody what to do. Yes, um, from a learning perspective, it's much more effective if, if in fact, they uh, experience these things for themselves and direct their own learning. But um, you shouldn't let risk arise uh, simply because you're, um, so pedantic that I'm doing coaching only that I'm not actually going to do any instruction um, that's not a good that's not really matching the teaching style to suit the learner or the pupil's needs so if we now look at that from uh, from a point of view of how would you describe it as a if you like a, a learning objective for, for you as a PDI or an ADI so what you're looking to do is develop your ability to relate the learner, to relate to the learner, sorry, on their terms using various teaching strategies, for example, Q&A, demonstration, explanations, instructions, talk through, partial, prompted, all those things you could class as teaching strategies because they're basically directed more from you than from the students. And any learning strategies, i.e. things like discovery, learning, structured experience, that's just an experience where you've actually established it again, something we discussed in previous uh, videos, where you encourage them to use the reflection to evaluate and assess the, the, any experience that they've had for themselves is effectively a learning strategy because it's getting them to learn from the, to get even more from the experience that they've just had by reflecting upon it afterwards. The use of GROW, which is a, obviously a coaching model. Um, again, you can say it's really a learning strategy because um, as a coach, you're always trying to 
and the ownership uh, ball to the students for them to direct their own learning, for them to assess where they're at and what they want to achieve and how we might go about achieving that uh, and checking that they will achieve it. Um, in other words, it's helping them learn how to learn. Um, but it is a very natural process. We we actually do do it naturally. As you all will now realize, um, for those of you that have watched the um, How Do I Learn uh, presentation that I developed uh, many years ago, um, on, on the video that was presented by Bob in a way which suits their learning preferences, current level of ability or aptitude and physical stroke, stroke e emotional state in pursuit of their learning goals and needs. So that's how you might express it as a target or a learning, ob uh, or learning objective for you to achieve. So if we take this on to the, the next competency, which is being able to analyze problems um, and take responsibility for their learning, again, looking at the guidance for examiners, how, uh, an indication of having competence in this regard would include uh, providing time in a suitable location um, to explore any problems or issues that arose during the lesson or that were raised by the pupil. So it's making time, making places, being conscious that perhaps that's something you need to talk about and then thinking, well, where could we talk about it? Because right now, at this moment in time, might not be the place to do it because there's too much going on. So that uh, where somebody does do that and makes note of these things and, and follows them up, that would indicate uh, having confidence in terms of uh, uh, encouraging the student to analyze problems and take responsibility for the learning. Providing timely opportunity for analysis uh, promptly, especially in the case of safety critical incidents, again, uh, would indicate that. Because again, as we were saying, because we're, it's like the old core competencies, but now the onus is less on the instructor to find a solution, but it's more on helping the, it's more on helping the pupil to find a solution for themselves. First of all, to recognize what the problem is um, and, and then to work out how best to uh, resolve it for themselves. Um, that's the, the main difference here. And this is why it's a, a te uh, teaching um, uh, and learning strategy, because you're actually encouraging the students to solve the problem themselves rather than you having all the answers. Uh, taking time and using suitable techniques to understand any problems a pupil had with understanding an issue I mean, you could say this goes back to coaching. It's about asking questions and digging deep and really understanding what's going on before you actually make any suggestions. And suggesting suitable strategies to help the pupil develop their understanding, such as using practical examples or pointing them to at further reading, uh, would indicate that you're trying to help them analyze and uh, take responsibility for learning because you're trying to get them to do more learning beyond simply what's happening in the car. Yeah, and which is obviously what we do with LDC because of which our, our system is student-centered. Um, and therefore it's all about trying to get the student to um, learn as much for themselves away from the car as well as being in the car. Giving clear and accurate information to fill gaps in the pupil's knowledge um, or understanding. Um, well, first of all, you've got to find what those gaps are and, and you won't find those gaps unless you actually ask, ask the questions uh, and raise the student's awareness. Because if you raise the student's awareness that they need knowledge or that they lack understanding in some ways, it uh, will actually uh, prompt them to actually want to know more or want to understand more. So in doing that, again, you're actually helping them to analyze problems and take responsibility for them learning. Leaving the pupil feeling that they have responsibility for their learning in the situation. So if the pupil thinks uh, that the responsibility for learning is just down to the instructor telling me what to do, then that's the opposite of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to help the student recognize that they have the power themselves um, to learn what they need to learn and they already have an innate ability 
to weigh things up and make brilliant decisions for themselves. You know, so um, don't just rely on the instructor. Um, you know, use your own capabilities because we all have this innate ability to learn. Um, as 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 pointed out in the how do we learn um, presentation workshop uh, that you will hopefully all uh, have or watch by the time you're looking at this video at least um, to know what I'm talking about. So bad practice, uh, lack of competence in this regard would leave the pupil feeling that the PDI was in control of the teaching process. So again, this is where the pupil just sits back. Um, is more like a spectator than a participant in the activity and is just waiting for orders to be barked out to them. That's what that means. Um, you're taking so much control that they're taking on the responsibility. If there's no responsibility, then there's no feeling of ownership and there's no feeling that it belongs to them. They are doing it because they've been told to do it not because they think it's the right thing to do, if you can see the difference between the two things. So obviously to be a safe driver, you want people to change their behavior or to do things in a particular way, not because you're telling them that they should do it. And not because if they don't do it, they'll fail the, fail the driving test. But the reason is because they can see that it makes sense to do it. Um, uh, on the assumption that everybody uh, wants to be safe. Nobody really wants to go out and be responsible for killing uh, you know, somebody else on the road. Um, uh, so, regard a number of failing to explore alternative ways of addressing a problem in response to evidence of a different learning preference. So if it becomes apparent that they, they like to learn one way, but you're ignoring that um, and you're not utilising that, uh, and that's showing that you're not really matching uh, what the student needs um, uh, as far as uh, helping them uh, aid their learning. Providing unsuitable or incorrect inputs. Again, we know where that, that potential leads. Um, and so, if again, if we look at some uh, part of the extract from the examiner's guide, it uh, quote here, it says, a key part of the client-centered approach is development of active problem solving in the pupil. This means that the PDI, ADI has to provide time for this to happen and has to stop talking for long enough for the pupil to do the work. So this is about, again, throwing back um, the uh, ownership ball uh, into their court. Uh, at every opportunity that you can, rather than uh, you doing all the work for them. The key thing to remember, however, is that different pupils will respond to this invitation to be actively involved uh, in different ways. Some may be able to do it instantly um, in a discussion. So some may uh, react to this very well, especially if they've been involved in a lot of modern teaching practice nowadays, where it is very client, student centered and orientated, then they will actually uh, adapt to it straight away and know what's going on um, and will have already experienced the pleasure of so sorting things out for themselves. But others may not. Others may have been told what to do all their life and feel that they've got no ability to make decisions for themselves. Well, um, in, in that case, it's important that you actually help them achieve an understanding that they do have that ability, really. So that's why it says others may need to go away and reflect upon a particular problem. So if people are like that, then maybe you need to give them time to reflect upon it and think about what's happening. So you're not going to try and force people just to, to operate in this particular way where they're providing all the answers you're actually just going to gradually allow them to uh, think about what's, what's happened, try to keep encouraging them to do this. Um, and uh, eventually, um, as we've seen in practice, when we've ever done this, the students do come over to, to the approach and actually quite like it and quite like to have their voice and their opinions heard and valued by the instructor. The main need to be pointed out um, at readings or other inputs to help them 
get a handle on the issue. Well, we've obviously got the workbook and video, which is client-centered, which hopefully encourages them to do more for themselves, to recognize that they don't need to just be um, a, an audience member. They can actually participate in this fully. Pushing a pupil to come up with answers on the spot may be unproductive for some. So this is really just reinforcing that while we want everybody to be client-centered, we want them to be student-centered, we want them ultimately to take responsibility for their own learning. Um, this doesn't mean that you should make the student feel uncomfortable by pushing, the, uh, by throwing a pile of answers at them and making them feel, um, um, you know, unproductive in some ways, it says. So that's what the, the DVSA say is a uh, lack of competence. If we now look at how we would uh, help you to reflect on your lesson to say, well, what what score should I give myself for T2? Then you need to ask yourself these questions. Did you provide opportunities for the learner to analyze problems or their performance in a suitable location and in a suitable time? So a suitable location could be on the move, um, on a quiet, uh, on part of your route, which is quiet, or it could mean actually stopping to have that discussion uh, in a timely manner, which whichever you feel uh, is best, um, or whichever the student feels is best for them. Um, did you encourage and give preference to the learner's own ideas and how best to solve problems or improve performance in pursuit of their own learning goals and needs? Don't assume that you've always got the best answers to these questions. Let the student suggest things and you might be surprised, you might learn some new things that you never really thought of before um, because every human being is really quite clever. So um, that's why you should keep that door always open. Help the learner to recognize any choices that might be inappropriate or too risky to undertake at this stage in their development. This is where in the coaching side we talk about using questions to raise awareness because what you're doing here is you've recognized that they feel that it's maybe a good idea to go on the motorway which is always a silly example was given by everybody who's under coaching um, um but in fact if, if you start to talk to them about well what's involved in being on the motorway and how fast do you need to drive and how fast have you driven so far blah 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 and what are the risks of getting it wrong <laughs> it doesn't take um, too long to actually make them realize that that might not be a smart option uh, at this stage. Um, so did you offer suitable choices or suggestions when the pupil wasn't able to direct their own learning rather than telling them what to do? So if the student really, for whatever reason, maybe you haven't actually got the, um, you haven't got the, the relationship right, the equal relationship established at this point or the rapport that you need to have um, established at this point, then they're going to be nervous about making choices or directing their own learning um, because they don't want to get it wrong and they don't want you to laugh at them. Um, so um, rather than forcing them, the, the best thing to do is simply to give them some choices. So you would say at this, at this stage, normally people do either this, this or or this, uh, any of those things that would be interested or might I suggest you consider this, that, or the other. Um, and get them engaged. Because by giving them a choice, you're forcing them, well, you're not forcing them, but you're encouraging them to make decisions for themselves. And then depending on how you respond um, to their, oh, I'll take an option too, then, you know, you obviously have to, to be positive about any choices that they make and then you actually have to carry, carry that choice through as they wished um, to, 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 to help them out. And eventually they'll start not just waiting for choices from you. Um, as a minimum, you should at least get them to agree to anything that, you, that you're going to do. You know, okay, well, at this stage, maybe we should do this. Are you happy with that? You know, at least get them to agree to whatever it is that you're suggesting that they might do next because they've had to say yes or no to it. So they've had to make a decision, be not a very hard decision. 
clicks on the ES or no decision. And so it is a fallback position, but keep always keep trying to get them to make the choice. If they can't make a choice for themselves, then offer them choices. If they can't make choices, then make suggestions. Um, and gradually over time, the students will come to you and start having their own ideas. Um, at least that's the theory. That's what, how it works in practice. Certainly uh, when we've experimented with this approach, um, we have found that sometimes students who are very nervous, particularly who lack confidence in themselves at an early stage, um, are frightened to make any suggestions um, at all to begin with. But as they grow in confidence, they actually start to partake more. Um, and once they realise that, you know, the instructor doesn't have all the answers and what's best for them is the chances are they will know what's best for them because they, they know themselves better than the instructor will ever know them. So help the learner explore the nature of the problem, I whether it's lack of knowledge, understanding, skill, self-belief, judgment, coordination, sensitivity, or even if it's an inappropriate attitude, um, or it's just down to their physical or emotional state at this stage. You need to find out about those those things and then you need to from that you can help the student um sort out um the, the problem if you like um attitude's an interesting one because um, one of the reasons for being client or student centered is that if the students make the decisions then they're more likely to change their attitudes um, towards those that would be you'd more associated with safe driving but it has to be their choice it can't really be your choice um, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to encourage by raising the student's awareness of things to, uh, and how to weigh things up. You're trying to get them to make these choices so that they change their ultimately their values or indeed their beliefs about certain things. Um, the way to do it is not trying to force your beliefs or your values onto the students, but it's to help them have the information that they need to to weigh to for themselves because with the human beings being clever the chances are they will come to something very similar um, to yourself in this regard and it will be of a positive nature encourage the learner to take on as much responsibility as was safely possible for any learning task or activity undertaken so these are things that you need to ask yourself uh, before you decide to give yourself a, a three or a zero or whatever number you decide to give yourself when you're actually uh, you using that reflective blog, that reflective sheet. So if we now look at it as a, a skill, then the skill is um, to develop your ability to encourage the learner to take responsibility for their learning and analyze the outcomes of their efforts or behavior with a view to finding their own way forward before offering inputs of your own. So always go to them first. I help the pupil recognize opportunities for further development improvement, especially in regards to safety critical driving faults, um, I potentially new um, learning needs as they arise or where your intervention prevented um, uh, as they arise or were by your in, or were by your intervention prevented with a view to accepting responsibility to sort to sort them out. So that's what you're trying to do as a, a skill. That takes us on to um, T3, clarify learning outcomes. Did you, uh, were there opportunities, uh, you know, or, and or examples used to clarify learning outcomes? Indications of having uh, competence in this regard as far as the DBSA guidance to examiners is concerned is using examples identified on a lesson in a suitable way and at a suitable time to confirm or reinforce understanding, exploring different ways to use examples to respond to differences in preferred learning styles, using examples that are within the pupil's range of experience and ability to understand, recognizing that some pupils will be able to respond instantly while others will take time to think about the issue, and again, extracted from um, the DBSA's guidance to examiners. While training in techniques is core to the learning process, it is important to reinforce this input and to link it with theory. 
the best way to do this is to use real life or real world situations during the lesson. The use of practical examples and scenarios on the lesson gives the pupil a better understanding of where, how and why to use a particular uh, technique. So it's where you're trying to show is where you're trying to find an example of what you mean by applying this or doing this in a particular way. This can be done, for example, by asking the pupil to think about why mirrors are important when changing direction. In other words, you're using a question there to get them to explore um, why, why, why this particular learning outcome is important, i.e. the use of mirrors in that case. So if we look at lack of confidence in this regard, using examples the pupil cannot really understand through lack of experience. So if you're trying to use an example that is beyond their level of comprehension at this point in time because of where they are, in their learning journey, and that's what that's basically meaning. Using complex examples that the pupil didn't have the ability to respond to, um, you know, trying to come up with something that's so complicated, which might make sense to you, but doesn't clearly make sense to them, um, isn't going to help them in terms of understanding what learning outcome we're trying to achieve. Failing to give the pupil time to think through the issues and come to their own conclusion. Uh, again, if you jump in, um, before they've had time to figure things out for themselves uh, in respect to what it is that the outcome they're looking for, then that's what that means. Uh, or imposing an interpretation, you know, before they've even had a chance to uh, respond to what it is that they're, that they're expecting, what is the learning outcome that's just been achieved or not been achieved, as the case may be. So if we look at uh, exactly how you would reflect upon this, you'd ask yourself the question, did you use money meaningful examples, scenarios, similes, metaphors, or comparisons to aid understanding, uh, to raise awareness of risk that suited the learner's experience and current ability or give them time to reflect on what you had said? Did you clarify what the learner had gained from the activity, i.e. the learning outcome, or help them to recognize whether this matched the learning outcome they sought. You know, how close a fit is it? Did you give the learner sufficient time to respond to your questions or statement? And, and did you allow the learner to come to their own conclusions about what had been learned? And in light of this, what new learning outcomes, stroke goals they wanted to now achieve? In terms of looking at it as a, uh, 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 an objective, a skills objective. The skill is to develop your ability to help the learner fully appreciate the learning outcomes they are aiming for, either their learning goals or needs, or those actually achieved, whether by design or by or not, by reference to examples, scenarios, scenarios, sorry, or opportunities that arose during the lesson to make this more obvious. Use examples, scenarios, similes, metaphors, or comparisons to improve the learner's understanding of what they are trying to achieve, or indeed um, what they are not, or indeed what they have achieved. So that's it expressed as a, as, as a, as a target, as a skills target. That brings us on to T4, the learning strategy T4, which is technical information. Um, was it comprehensive? Was it appropriate? Or was it accurate? Indications of having this competence in this regard is probably obvious, which is giving clear, timely, and technically accurate demonstrations or explanations, checking understanding, and if necessary, repeating the demonstration or explanation. Although I would add that you might need to, to do the demonstration or explanation again, but in a slightly different way if they didn't get it on the first pass um, finding a different way to demonstrate or explain if the pupil still does not understand and then if we look at uh, uh, an extraction from that from the, uh, the, the guide to examiners it's a I quote it says remember that good information is accurate relevant and timely failure to meet any one of these criteria makes the others redundant 
given incorrect or ins insufficient information with the result that a safety critical situation might occur will result in an automatic failure. Again, um, here's another warning again, it's repeating the importance of making sure that you have this background knowledge that we keep talking about, we keep harping on about, which you would get in, from going through the exercises uh, in binder one and making sure that you study all the detail for each of the different uh, lessons in the LD system. Information given must be comprehensive when associated with the recurring weakness in the pupil's driving. Um, in other words, they, 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 want it to, they want it to be complete rather than incomplete. Simply telling the pupil that they have done something wrong is unlikely to help them overcome the problem. Unclear or misleading advice would also, should also be avoided. And comments such as, you're a bit close to those parked cars, um, could be used to introduce a coaching uh, on weakness, a coaching question on weakness, but are of little use on their own as they are unclear. So if there is no fall, immediate follow-on with a coaching question to you're a bit close, um, uh, then that's not a very good question because what is a bit close or what is a little a bit too hard or what is a little bit too soft? The, these are quite arbitrary um, and therefore... Uh, a better question might be to say, can you tell me um, what influenced your decision to keep that separation distance between you and the parked car that we just passed? Might be a better question to ask so that you can actually understand where they're coming from um, and, in fact, whether they've even recognised that they were close or not, as the case uh, may be. Um, close to you may be different to close to them. You would need to describe what close was and why, um, you know, why you would not be that close. You know, what where where does it become close? You know, why in that circumstance would you consider that to be close? Now you you know that from your experience. Your experience tells you that that was too close. But what is it that's actually what is behind that? What is too close? What did you factor in? What did you consider? What was make it, What would make you decide that I need to be a bit further away from that parked car than your learner was? So that's really um, the point that the, it's trying to make uh, make here about technical information. Um, for similar reasons, um, you know, it, it's important not not to use jargon, and no doubt that might even appear here as far as lack of competence. Um, so in regards to lab and lack of competence, it's providing inaccurate or unclear information too late or too early in the learning process. Uh, failing to check understanding. So if it's become apparent to the examiner that it completely misunderstood what you were just said and you weren't aware of that yourself, then, then you're failing to check understanding as far as the examiner is concerned because he can he or she can see that what's what you thought you communicated hasn't been received failing to explore alternative ways of presenting information when the pupil does not understand the first offering so if we now look at how you would actually assess yourself in your lesson reflection was the technical information given comprehensive, appropriate, and accurate, the, what you need to ask yourself is, did you provide either Q&A, explanations, or demonstrations that were necessary and appropriate to whom and why? So you have to have a clear understanding why you're having these techniques, and you have to clearly make sure that the right level for the student, which is why it then goes on to say, uh, provide Q&A, explanations, or demonstrations that were necessary and appropriate, accurate, timely and at the right level for the learner. So all those things need to be considered when you're actually uh, providing information using that, any of those techniques. Uh, check the information you have communicated was in fact received. So whenever you give information, it's always a good practice to clarify um, whether they've received it by asking them a question about what you've just said, basically. Um, um, or uh, 
ask simply asking them, does that does that sort of make sense to you? Um, and then look at the body language. That's just because they say, oh yeah, that's clear, depending on how they say it was clear, would actually tell you maybe it wasn't so clear. And if not, did you look to find more appropriate ways to get the information across? So there you go. And avoid ambiguous information, instructions or comments or jargon as well, we could add to that list. So that's how you would assess is, um, you know, uh, this particular competency when you've done your driving lesson. Um, and now if you're looking at it as a target to, to develop your ability, you need to develop your ability to use Q&A or give explanations or demonstrations that are accurate, relevant, and timely while checking that they are understood and welcomed by the learner. So that brings us now on to feedback. And if we, again, we go back, start off with the guidance to examiners, having confidence in regards to feedback is providing feedback in response to questions from the learner. That's usually the best time to do that. Seeking appropriate opportunity to provide feedback that reinforces understanding or confirms achievements of learning objectives or goals. Providing feedback about failure to achieve learning goals that helps the pupil achieve an understanding of what they now need to do. In other words, where are opportunities for improvement? Providing feedback that the pupil can obviously understand. All these are uh, what you would consider good practice. Providing consistent feedback that is reinforced by your know, body language. So, you know, if you're saying something, if, if you're praising somebody, then look happy about it. If you're praising somebody, but you look as miserable as hell, then he's not going to com be convinced that, that you didn't, you weren't impressed with it at all. So do make sure that your body language and the message that you communicate are, are tie in because, um, you probably already realized from a lot of the previous um, workshops that words are not the most important thing that we consider when you're communicating. And quite often, the body language is uh, considered the more important indicator of what it is you're really saying uh, and what you're really meaning, and whether you are being sincere or whether you're not being sincere. So, all fact feedback should be relevant, positive, and honest. <laughs> It is not helpful if the pupil is given unrealistic feedback, which creates a false sense of their own ability. Where possible, feedback should not be negative. So it's best to talk about the cup being half full and half empty. And rather than saying somebody has a weakness, consider expressing it as a learning opportunity. There you go. I knew it said it somewhere <laughs> in the examiner's guidance and, and uh, you have it from the, the horse's mouth. However, if they need to be told something is wrong or dangerous, there is no point in waffling. You know, if you, if you, can't, if you can't express the point you're trying to make in a positive way, then don't keep waffling. Be judgmental. Tell them that you don't think it was appropriate and then tell them why you think it was, wasn't appropriate. Um, so rather than waffle and confuse the pupil, you know, it's uh, you know, it's better to to you know use judgmental language uh, and make it very clear to the student, even though it might not be the way that you would have liked to have done it. Um, at least the points been gotten across, and that's what's important, particularly when we're talking about uh, safety critical issues. It's more important that it's understood um, uh, why it's dangerous or wrong than for it not to be clear because you don't want to upset the pupil, if you see what I mean. Um, so the pupil should have a realistic sense of their own performance. So again, that's straight from the guidance. Feedback, uh, bad practice indication of lack of competence is providing feedback a long time after an incident so that the pupil cannot link the feedback to what happened. So, um, this is a timely bit, you see, is it appropriate and is it timely? Because if it's not timely, they'll have forgotten about the incident that you're talking about. 
um, and so it might not be very relevant or useful and may just add to confusion, um, especially if they're not sure which incident you're actually talking about. So um, that would show a lack of competence. Uh, providing feedback that overlooks a safety critical incident. So if you're concentrating on things like their technique and other matters, um, uh, or things that are less important or irrelevant, um, and you're actually overlooking the most important, uh, you know, uh, the real uh, thing in, in the room, the real elephant in the room, either safety critical incident, then that would suggest that your, your, your feedback is not very good. Even though we are talking about feedback this time from a teaching and learning point of view, I do realise there is an R5, which is also feedback, but that is more to do uh, with risk management. Nevertheless, um, you know, not relating whatever the, uh, uh, the, if you like, the lack of skill, knowledge, or understanding that is responsible, that is potentially at the root cause of a safety critical incident um, would cause you to be marked down in this area as well as um, R5. Continuously providing feedback when it may be distracting pupil. So this is where you might give them a running commentary of everything that's going on around them, which might be very impressive that you can do that. Um, but it's just background noise. And this is bad as putting the radio on them and having music blurting out or getting them to answer the flaming phone. Um, it's very difficult for a, a, a pupil to concentrate um, and immerse themselves in the experience if you're forever talking or distracting them in some way. Um, you know, which is why it's part of the setup, you know, making clear to the student if there's anything that I do as an instructor that is distracting you or is bugging you or is annoying you, don't be frightened to let me know. You know, because we all do things. We might tap our fingers, we might go boom, dum, 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 dum. <laughs> you never know what it is, but it could be distracting. And in this case, of course, they're talking about giving giving feedback. Sometimes instructors know so much that they don't know when to shut up. They don't know when to stop. They don't know that there's no point in overloading the student. The student cannot take in what you're giving them. So there is no point in giving it in the first place. So that's what that's about. Failing to check the pupils' understanding of feedback. This is like we've spoken before, a lot of things need to, you need to clarify everything. When you're communicating with somebody, you're always trying to make sure that what you've said is what's been received or what they've said, you've actually understood properly. So this clarification works both, both ways. So failing to check the pupils' understanding of feedback, again, can be a mistake. Um, you know, just because um, you think they've understood it doesn't necessarily mean that they have um, and if their body language or the, the way they've acknowledged this feedback um, would suggest to the examiner that he didn't understand what you were on about and you've not actually picked up what I've picked up then that's not good for you providing feedback that is irrelevant to the pupil's learning objectives for example comment, commenting on their personal appearance so uh, while wow, you, you might think it will win you some brownie points, compliments, oh, you look very good today, darling, or whatever. Um, it's totally uh, unnecessary and inappropriate. And if the only feedback you need to give them is to do with the learning objectives, to do with the lesson. Do be very careful about being dragged in, um, you know, into any situation, especially anything of a personal nature, anything to do probably with religion, anything to do with football or anything. You know, be very careful. Um, and in fact, I would always suggest that you avoid getting drawn in to giving feedback on any of those matters. Um, and you like you like a politician, you avoid it, or you, you say something like, "Well, I'm sorry to hear that." However, if we if we get back to the lesson, then we can you know concentrate on helping you achieve this today, which will hopefully make you feel a bit better. So. You need to quickly direct them back to the learning process. Refusing to hear reasonable feedback about the ADI, PDI or the ADI's own performance. Again, if the student is clearly wanting to complain or say something, 
uh, about what you're doing, which they don't think is helpful, and you shut them up or you keep them quiet or you just ignore them, then again, that that's not that's not good. So you can see from this feedback, isn't just about um, giving feedback to the PDI. It's actually getting feedback from the PDI about your performance or indeed about other people's um other people's behavior because from that um you can actually perhaps help them formulate a better attitude depending on what how they view that be behavior from that other driver for example so feedback's a two-way process ah there we go <laughs> and uh something again being extracted uh, from the examiner's guidance notes it, it actually a quote of, uh, it, it says feedback is a two-way street it should ideally be prompted by the pupil um, with the pdi uh, adi responding to the pupil's questions or comments the best time to give feedback is in response to a pupil's query or question because you know they're very open to receiving the information that you're then about to give However, whatever you do, don't answer it immediately. Repeat the question possibly back to them and think, is there anything else I need to know before I answer this? Have I got enough information to give some sensible feedback in regard to this question or comment that's just been made? Um, anyway, this is di uh, diver uh, diverging from the quote. And the quote then goes on to say, the pupil's feedback should never be overlooked or disregarded. A pupil needs to have a clear picture of how they are doing against their learning objectives or goals or needs or anything else that they're trying to work on um, at this point in time throughout the lesson. So how would you assess um, your own performance in this regard after you've delivered all the driving lesson? Well you need to ask yourself these questions did you provide useful feedback ideally in response to the learners questions or comments to help the learner to reflect on their own performance to identify what knowledge understanding skill or self-belief they need you know did you provide useful feedback to help the learner evaluate their own performance and consider what their next goal might be on their uh, based on their learning needs at the time? Uh, and did you provide useful feedback to help the learner decide upon an appropriate course of action in pursuit of any goals or learning outcomes chosen? Um, did you provide useful feedback to confirm the achievement of the course program learning targets or objectives? Although uh, as far as your standards are checking part three, you probably won't do that as part of the, the middle part of the lesson. You probably do that as part of the end lesson after the, the standards check or the part three test has finished. But if you could do it quickly, I, I guess you, you could do it um, uh, there and then as part of what you do. Um, did you provide useful feedback to help the learner to assess their readiness for the driving test? Um, this would come later on in their journey. So you're not assessing people's readiness for the driving test at the early stages, naturally. Um, so when you're comparing their performance, you're comparing their performance as what you would reasonably expect at that level of their development, not at test standard. Um, so that really comes into being much more when you get closer to the driving test or if you're assessing a full license holder. Um, did you provide you some feedback that was supported by and congruent with your body language? In other words, that does again what you say and um, what your body language uh, communicates are they in step with one another? So that's how you would um, reflect and assess your performance. And finally, did you invite relevant feedback on your own performance from your learner? Looking at it as a um, an objective for you to achieve a uh, skills objective or skills target um, you know you're looking to develop your ability to provide feedback that is relevant timely positive 
and honest to help the learner assess their progress against the progress targets on their learning goals and needs, become aware of any safety critical misconceptions, discover opportunities for development, improvement, i.e. driving faults, new learning needs, um, feedback that is positive and honest to help the human fuel their motivation and self-belief, i.e. inspire self-trust and ownership. So feedback can obviously be in the form of praise. And did you develop your, uh, you need to develop your ability to obtain, accept feedback from your learner to help you improve your own performance. So that's how you would look at it as a skills target uh, for yourself. That brings us on to um, T6, um, pupils queries. Were the pupils queries followed up and answered? Uh, and again, going back to the DBSA's guidance, to examiners, um, indication of having confidence in this regard would include the PDI, ADI, creating a learning environment that encourages the pupil to ask questions throughout the lesson. This is all about the equal relationship that we talk about in client-centered uh, learning or student-centered learning. Uh, it's another workshop I developed many, many years ago, um, uh, which really emphasizes the importance of this, this equal relationship responding openly, readily, and appropriately to queries. That again is all to do with the same relationship that we're talking about. Providing answers of sufficient content or directing pupils to suitable sources of information. Actively confirming with pupils if their comments or body language suggest they may have a question. So the, the query might not be direct, it might be indirect encouraging the pupil to explore possible solutions uh, for themselves um, again as we've said in previous things um, you're always trying to uh, push the ownership ball back to the student so where you can do that then do this this is what client centered learning the student centered learning is all about it's about engaging and involving the pupil in trying to find their own solutions and take responsibility for their own learning. Finally, another quote from the uh, examiner's guidance. Remember that whenever possible, the pupil should be encouraged to discover answers for themselves. So this is just re-emphasizing the point I was making earlier. However, if the PDI ADI does not need to provide information, that must ensure that the pupil completely However, if the PDI does need to provide information, they must ensure that the pupil completely understands the information given. Pupils may not always have the confidence to ask direct questions. The PDI ADI should be able to pick up comments or body language that indicates uncertainty or confusion and use suitable techniques to explore those issues. This is where you would either use Q and A or you would use coaching questions to explore what's going on here. I need to know what's happening. This is not the response I would be expecting. Um, um, so the pupils obviously indirectly potentially got a query or a question or there's something that is, that is actually troubling them. And of course, they're not going to be able to con concentrate effectively on the learning task while ever that continues to trouble them. So the best thing is to find out what it is and get it sorted out then. Um, and having confidence in this regard is, is, you know, being tuned in to your learner, you know, um, which sort of ties in with the, with the R3 where you're making sure that you're aware of your surroundings and your pupils' actions, if you think about it, the, the two closely tied together. So, um, bad practice, were the pupils' questions followed up and answered? I probably, you probably guess what the bad practice is. Lack of eye competence in this regard would include the PDI making no effort to encourage the pupil to ask questions in the first place and to suppress them from uh, asking questions. And refusing to respond to queries, you know, or putting them off or saying, um, you can figure that out for yourself later on. Uh, providing inaccurate or incomplete information in response to queries or waffling 
and pretending that you know the answer when you clearly don't know the answer um and making it you know making making them feel uncomfortable if they carry on persisting trying to delve deeper uh, because they don't quite understand what it is that you're saying avoiding the question or denying responsibility for answering it that's not for me to say <laughs> Which is true if it's to do with a private matter, but if it's actually a query related to their learning, then um, it is something that you need to respond to. So how would you actually assess, um, in your lesson reflection, how would you assess how you performed in regards to this particular teaching and learning strategy, uh, this competence, this uh, teaching and learning strategy competence? You would ask yourself, did you actively listen for any queries or concerns explicitly expressed or implied a body language by the learner did you check your understanding of what was being expressed so whether it was explicitly expressed um, or whether it wasn't it's always best to check with them what it is that they're wanting from you uh, so that you do actually know what it is that you, what you need to answer because it's so easy to make an assumption about what the person's asking um, and do uh, and end up giving the information that's not useful to them or get them to back off completely um, because they realize that they didn't perhaps ask the question in the right way and therefore they feel you know embarrassed by it. Um, did you help the learner to find their own answers or explore possible solutions where appropriate? Did you check whether the information given was truly satisfactory and useful to them? Um, did you let the learner know if you couldn't answer the query or were unsure about any answers given, including how you intend to follow it up? So again, you know, unless it is something the examiner would really expect you to know, or uh, uh, it's quite, it's not unreasonable because you can't know everything um, to come back to them or... If it's a scenario or if you're trying to this is trying to get your view on how would you deal with this or that, then maybe you could explore it together. You know, that's like what you would do in those instances. Um, again, using your coaching skills and coaching questions. Did you check whether any proposed follow-up action was acceptable to the learner? Um, and so if you do say, Well, I, I'll get back to you on that uh, next time we meet. Just say, well, is that all right? Will is that will that sort you out? Because again, you you want them to put it to bed. Because if it's a query in their head at the moment and it's distracting them from their learning, you want them to put it to bed if you can. If you can see that they really want to know, and and if you have the books with you, then you can say, well, I said, what shall we get out the highway code and see what it says about that? And physically get the highway code out or driving the essential skills or the LD system workbook, whatever it happens to be. Um, if you can tell that really without having an answer to this, it's going to um, act as a distraction to them learning going off forward in the lesson. Um, and did you sensitively deal with queries or questions not part of the learning process or that perhaps would better dealt with at another time? This is about being professional, and this closely will link to T7. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, T7, which we will be looking at um, next. Um, so uh, we've said it before, I think it was in the feedback, you know, really think very carefully before getting involved in any uh, personal matters or uh, problems that they may have or discussions about religion or anything like that, or politics, you know, or football, you know. My advice would be keep clear of those things, keep neutral. Even if you have an opinion, I would suggest that you just keep the opinion to yourself um, and just acknowledge their opinion. Say, oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting way of looking at it. And then, so let's get back to the lesson, um, but be professional. So if we now look at this in terms of uh, a target of how you would actually express express 
this is an objective for you to achieve in terms of developing your skill, you would say something like to develop your ability to actively listen for questions, queries, or signs of uncertainty or discomfort, both verbal and nonverbal cues from the learner and respond appropriately with useful advice or information and or direct them to useful uh, reference resources um, or use a coach question to explore it further, as the case may be, um, to sensitively deal with queries or questions not part of the learning process, not to do with uh, driving, not to do with what we're, what we're trying to achieve today, basically, um, or that perhaps would be better dealt with at another time. You know, so sometimes maybe the question, you could deal with it now, um, but you could think, well, it's going to be, that's going to be quite a distraction for us. It might not be useful at this point. So what you would try to do is get the pupil to agree that we'll perhaps put that in the drawer and we'll deal with that another time because it's only going to perhaps um, um, de derail us from what we're trying to achieve today, for example. So that's why that might happen. So that's what it means um, in terms of, of um, as a skill that you're trying to develop. Um, be professional, which will bring us on to the next one, which is this non-discriminatory manner uh, competence. Um, did the trainer maintain an appropriate non-discriminatory manner throughout the session? Which which is um, probably one of the worst, worst, worst described competences in them. Oh, it basically means um, did you uh, maintain a professional manner with the student throughout the session? Um, you know, were you the consummate professional in the way you dealt with matters or situations that arose during the lesson? Uh, whether that be in the car or things that you've seen outside of the car. Anyway, an indication from the, the guidance again to examiners of having competence in this regard would be keeping a respectful distance and not invading the pupil's personal space. So that would be considered unprofessional and making somebody feel uncomfortable by actually uh, invading their personal space. So what it's saying here is that you keep a respectful distance and not invade their space. That would be considered having competency in this regard. Asking the pupil how they wish to be addressed well you probably sorted all that way before you got to a standards check by now so if they want to be called by their first name then that will have been resolved uh well before now uh, so it's unlikely that you're going to be asking them that question in your standards check especially if you're not even allowed to bring a beginner but if it happened to be that you were doing a test with a full license or when it's the very first time you met them then that might be an appropriate thing to do. Asking a disabled driver to explain what the PDI, ADI needs to know about their condition uh, is having confidence. Um, and this would also be true of anybody who has any learning differences. Uh, you know, again, again, it's it's something that you probably wouldn't be doing in your standards check or, or your part three test. These discussions would have probably would have happened uh, on the first lesson beforehand when you would already know that. However, when you met with the examiner on the standards check, um, if, if if your student had dyslexia, and obviously with the student's permission, um, you would it, might, it would be wise for you to make the examiner aware of what you knew in this regard uh, as part of your brief to them now, um, before you actually start the actual um, um, standards check or the part three test. Uh, adopt an appropriate position in the car. Ad adopting an appropriate position in the car. Not quite sure what that might mean. <laughs> uh, there may be some positions you could adopt that wouldn't be. Uh, maybe maybe putting your arm over here or doing this might not be considered appropriate, I guess. Um, using language about other road users that is... Uh, not derogatory, um, and that does not invite the pupil to collude with any discriminatory attitudes. 
So this is about obviously um, not uh, calling people idiots or stupid or any other type of communists, calling them whatever you might want to call them, um, which I'm not going to state here, but you know what I mean. Um, then uh, either agreeing with a student, uh, if you did that, you don't don't collude with it. Just um, there's quite a few instructors um, I've come across often use things like just assume that it's a, a good driver on a bad day. If they if they've done something that you might consider to be not very sensible, uh, shall we say? So that's what that means. Uh, again, quoting from the examiner's guidance, the PDI ADI should maintain an atmosphere in which the pupil feels comfortable to express their opinions. Uh, this, this takes us back to the equal relationship, if you think about it. They should create an open, friendly environment for learning, regardless of the pupil's age, gender, sexual orientation, ethic, ethnic background, religion, physical abilities, or any other irrelevant factors, i.e. irrelevant to, to the learning. This implies active respect for the pupil, their values, and what that constitutes appropriate behaviour in their culture. So this is what it's all about. It's about, you know, uh, recognising that people are different, but that doesn't make mean that there's anything wrong with that individual other than that they may be different to to yourself so examples of bad practice again i guess you probably can now guess what that one could be invading somebody's physical space touching the pupil including uh, trying to shake hands unless it is necessary for safety reasons Uh, using somebody's uh, first name unless they have said that is acceptable, commenting on the pupil's appearance or any other personal attribute unless it is a direct impact on their ability to drive safety, such as wearing shoes that make it difficult for them to operate the vehicle's pedals. Uh, again, you would, before your standards check or your, um, your part three, you would have hopefully sorted out any issues to do with what we're going to wear, the shoes and and all that sort of stuff uh, well in advance. Uh, and, and it then goes on another quote from the ex uh, examiner's guidance. The ADI must not display inappropriate attitudes or behaviours towards other road users and should challenge their pupil if they display these uh, behaviours. So this is where if, if you hear discriminatory attitudes uh, especially where you feel that they're emotionally charging your students, then they need to realise that um, getting a strop on or getting worked up by somebody else's driving behaviour, um, apart from not making them feel very uh, nice about stuff, it actually will make them dangerous. So it's really getting the message on that they need to be chilled out, they need to be cool. No matter what propagation happens on the road, you need to avoid road rage, basically. So this is the area that it's dealing with, uh, dealing with, with here, basically. So how are you going to assess and reflect your performance in this regard? Did the examiner, did the trainer maintain an appropriate non-discriminatory manner throughout the session? The question is, did you create and maintain an equal relationship? Did you ex exhibit humility and respect for the client? Did you maintain a professional distance, being careful to avoid personal matters or potentially controversial subjects of no relevance to the lesson at hand? Did you sensitively explore any uh, physical difficulties or cultural differences or you know, other learning differences or problems that might impact on the learning process with a view to minimising their uh, effect. Uh, as we said before, you would have hopefully covered those before the standards check in part three, uh, but you might need to make 
um, the examiner aware of them? Again, with the pupil's permission. Uh, did you actively listen to make sure you were in no way offending the learner or making them feel uncomfortable by your behaviour? Um, so again, this is watching the body language and, and, and seeing how they respond to you and, and what you say. Things that are not mentioned here are things like swearing, you know, losing your temper, shouting. All those things are, are, non, are, are not professional. So, um, you know, although they weren't particularly mentioned earlier, you know, if you hadn't already figured that out for yourself, that they also fall into this category. Um, did you adapt your behavior when necessary to make the learner feel comfortable and at ease and act professionally throughout the lesson? And then we express that as a, as a learning target, as a skill, as a skills objective. You need to develop your ability to make your learner feel welcome, comfortable, safe, and appreciated. Being careful to recognize uh, accommodate and be sensitive towards differences in culture while potentially challenging any form of discriminatory behavior um, that you may uh, experience. Um, this doesn't mean that it's your job to be the police officer and to uh, get angry with your pupil if they, if they happen to be a racist, for example. What this means is that you need to professionally explain that you don't wish to hear those types of comments in your vehicle. And if that is something that this pupil cannot refrain from doing, then uh, you would have to say, I'm afraid as a consequence of that, I will no longer be able to be your driving instructor. So that's what that, that means. It, it doesn't mean that we want you to be police officers. Uh, it just means that we you need to make it clear that this is not acceptable while they're in your car uh, with you. Um, you know, and that you don't want to be, you don't want to upset them, you don't want to be angry with them. Um, but it, they just need to know that you don't want to hear those types of attitudes. Um, you need to develop your ability to adopt a totally professional manner and attitude towards all people with whom you come in contact while using your driving school car or providing training services to your customers. In other words, you need to be professional, not only when you're in the car with your pupils, but whenever you're out about using your car and out and about in the public. You are now a driving instructor you will become known in the area as a driving instructor. So if you have road rage or you are, you're involved in altercations, do not be surprised that that would damage your business, just as it was if somebody was in, you know, uh, in, in, in any sort of public service, if they behave in a, 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 in a way that is um, inconsistent with the, the job that they do. Uh, so do be aware of that um, and hopefully you're that type of person in any case you're not the type of person that is um, is discriminatory in this way and does get upset over the least little thing um, so that's expressing it as a target that brings us on to the, the final uh, teaching and learning strategy competence which is reflection you know at the end of the session was the pupil encouraged to reflect on their own performance well as you know where we operate we would encourage you to get them to reflect on their performance you know after every one of their um, um you know their learning steps after every one of their learning chunks um but uh, as it states here it, it suggests at the end of the session i don't know if that means a session as a chunk or whether it means a session of the lesson but it could mean the end of, of a lesson. Um, so indications of having confidence in this regard would include at the end of the session, the pupil should be encouraged to reflect on their performance and discuss their feelings with the PDI, ADI. The ADI, PDI, ADI should encourage honest self-appraisal and use client sensitive techniques to highlight areas that need development if the student has not recognized them. Once developed areas have been identified, 
the pupil should be increased to make them part of the future development. Um, let's go back on that one. So that's that's what it says in the uh, uh, in the DVSAs. When you're on the standards check or part three, you only have two minutes to wrap up your lesson to do this, if you like, this reflection. So it has to be done fairly superficially um, on the test. And you need to concentrate specifically on what's been achieved uh, in, in a way to help remind um, the examiner what we set out to achieve and what we have achieved. Um, and then if there is time, we can explore what we might look at next. But you're going to do a proper end of lesson reflection after the part three um, or the standards check in any case, possibly include marking the workbook uh, uh, and um, encouraging them to do a fuller reflection using the workbook and, uh, and the planning forms that are in that particular workbook. So that's, anyway, that's the guidance from the DVSA. Uh, this is how you, we would expect you to assess your performance uh, in regard to the lesson reflection. Uh, and this is actually for a full lesson, it's not just for a part three and one standards check lesson. At the end of the session, was the pupil encouraged to reflect on their own performance? Did you encourage the learner to reflect on their performance during any learning activity to establish whether the goal had been attained? Our learning need had been satisfied at the end of the lesson to evaluate first impression progress progress and between each lesson to establish a potential plan or a goal for the next lesson. So that's how we would do it, which is not precisely what you need for the part three or the standard check. And with again expressing this as um uh, as a skills objective, develop your ability to encourage the learner to use the LDC driving skills workbook to reflect upon their performance using the reflective lesson log, mark their progress using the LDC system progress targets, or you mark it with them along with the master progress chart, and develop encourage them to develop a plan for the next lesson using their lesson plan sheet. Uh, reflect on your own performance as, as a driving instructor, uh, uh, which you can obviously use those reflective uh, sheets that we encourage you to fill out every time you give a driving lesson as a PDI or um, as a, a an ADI if, if you're preparing uh, for a standards check. So that covers all the um, teaching uh, learning strategies, sorry, teaching and learning strategy competencies T1 through to T8. I hope this has is, is helped you see how they fit in and how they tie very closely to the risk management and in fact even the, the lesson planning competencies and how you can't really look at everything as, as single items because you go through the lesson as we saw when we, we looked at the lesson chunk. Um, if you follow that through from start to beginning, you can see how all of these competencies are potentially going to be marked as you progress through that lesson chunk. And there's all that a lesson is made up of is a series of lesson chunks. Even if the, the lesson chunk happens just to be a drive to where you want to start the lesson, then that still is a lesson chunk and it should still have some purpose and objective. So on your way to wherever it is you want to start the lesson, perhaps because it's it's to do uh, with the manoeuvre, then there should be some purpose in that drive that you're trying to achieve so that you can actually set yourself a goal or some things to work on or some things to improve so that at the end of that drive, you can explore uh, what you achieved and then you could go into your, your full lesson. So a lesson chunk um, is really any uh, unit of, of learning which is um, can be secular in, in nature or can be like if you're driving to a place or then driving back. Similarly, 
if you're driving back home, then set a series of goals for driving back home. And this is important when you're on the part three or standard chain. When it's come, when it when you realise that you're running out of time and you need to set off back to the test centre, then that's another learning chunk, and you need to decide on setting yourself some goals or some things to work on or some things to, to improve on the drive back from wherever you are now till you get back to the driving centre. So you just have to get used to breaking things into ch chunks. Um, and each chunk has a beginning and a middle and an end, just like a lesson has a beginning, a middle and an end. So I hope that helps you understand where the, the, the teaching and learning strategies come in, what are in fact teaching uh, strategies versus learning strategies, and where they appear uh, during a typical driving lesson as part of these lesson chunks um, that we've been uh, talking about. So I'll stop sharing the screen now. And um, I thank you for, um, for watching this video and I hope you found it useful. I hope you found the whole series um, useful. Um, obviously, as you probably realized, I've done these just off, off the cuff really. I'm actually, I'm not working from a script or anything. Um, and I'm just trying to uh, cover things as they come come to mind, but I hope that they found them useful. Um, they do tie in with a, a lot of the training materials you already have. So aspects of what we've been covering today um, are detailed in teaching driving ma manual in the guided practice section, for example. If you look at that, you'll straight away, even though we call it the coaching cycle, you will see straight away that that's the same as a learning chunk or a lesson chunk. Um, uh, and, and it covers all the core competencies um, uh, and, it, and it covers exactly how you break things down into little elements and, and so on and so forth. So the teaching driving manual has good information there. The um, student-centered, guide to student-centered learning has all the stuff there with the three different roles that, that we talk about, has all the information. And of course, the most recent guide that we produced, which was the quick guide, to the part three in the standards check um, booklet that I, that I produced, um, which tries to sort of summarize everything and particularly focus on these 17 competencies and try to show how they're sort of interconnected and, and how they interrelate is in that booklet as well. So with all that material um, and then with some fantastic training that you'll get from um, some of our trainers, um, hopefully that will help you achieve a grade A um, on your standards check. So I'd like to feel that everybody is looking for a grade A. And then if you get a pass, then that's still good as well. Um, but try for a, try to go for a grade A on your first attempt. And there are quite a few of our instructors or our PDIs, um, and certainly people on the standards check have achieved that. Um, so there's no reason why you can't achieve that just with a little bit of extra effort on your behalf so thank you again for watching the video and the series and no doubt i will or you will see me in, in some other videos in the near future thank you for the time being bye for now